Get in, Normie. We're gonna save Western civilization. Or are we? What happens when a controversial political YouTuber... It is not acceptable to call me a... You know what? Fair enough. You can't change that you're a... And it's not very nice for me to call you a... I won't do it. Or call yourself or your friends a... Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Transitions into real life politics. You have a video where you call Chinese people It's broadly accepted as a racist term. Yeah, I know. That's why I use that. To find out, we have to learn about Sargon of Akkad. Starting off spicy already. Starting off la spicy la already. Real name Carl Benjamin, little is known about his life before his YouTube fame besides the fact that he started a game dev company with a friend of his in mid-2012 called Otherworld Software, oh. something he'd been working on for about a year already. You see, Carl's original objective was to become a game developer, and the company had already made a few small games. His YouTube account, Sargon of Akkad 100, was created in 2010 and was completely inactive up until June 2013, when, after years of slow-burning online conflict between feminists and the skeptic and gamer communities, he released a critique of a video released by the then-popular feminist figure Anita Sarkeesian. The video was the first of many, and while they weren't instantly successful, they slowly established Sargon as another member of the skeptic community, which would soon become the breeding ground for the early anti-SJW movement. Still, at the time, he was far from a full-fledged political commentator and often made videos that had nothing to do with those topics, as his main goal continued to be game development. In early 2014, Sargon created a Kickstarter page for the game he was making called Necromancer, which he promoted on his main channel. The project raised 8,000 pounds in under one month and promptly released a playable demo. However, within a month of this release, Sargon's channel had already grown to over 3,000 subs, which was surprising since he hadn't put that much effort toward it. With the small bit of experience with crowdfunding from his game dev endeavors, he set up a Patreon for himself which I suspect makes him one of the earliest adopters of that content creator business model. For context, Patreon was created less than one year before Sargon made his page. As early as July, he was already getting a little bit of money on it, a sign that there was a demand for the kind of content he was making. However, making individual videos on each topic he wanted to cover wasn't very efficient, so instead, he started doing a series called This Week in Stupid, a kind of equals three equivalent, but for topics he was interested in. Sargon was quickly earning a name for himself in the anti-feminist sphere, because while other YouTubers from the early 2010s occasionally broached that topic, none were primarily focused on it, meaning he could tap into that market. He had already made a few videos that got hundreds of thousands of views, but things ramped up once he made his first ever Gamergate video. If you don't know what Gamergate was, believe me, you're witnessing its consequences to this day. Basically, a video game developer by the name of Zoe Quinn was accused by her ex-boyfriend of sleeping with video game journalists for positive reviews, including one Nathan Grayson who had positively covered Zoe's works. This relatively minor controversy spiraled into a debate about ethics in video game journalism. At least, that's the perspective of one side of the conflict. The other side, which was backed and represented by the main gaming news outlets, framed it as misogynist gatekeeping women out of gaming. This conflict became hashtag Gamergate, which coincided, if not kicked off, the anti-social justice it was both as a content creator in the sphere at the time and as somebody who's collabed with a lot of the people he just mentioned uh it was both it was both it was a breeding ground for misogyny and it was a question about journalism in gaming it was both and the reality is is that everybody was polarizing and everyone was incredibly hateful at the time and there were men that I knew who built whole careers lying about women in order to make money. And now nobody knows who they are because everybody found out they were scummy or their audience gave up on them because they even, you know, betrayed the hope that their audience had for them. So it was both. And just like we see it now where opportunities come up and you realize like, oh my gosh, there's misogyny at play. A lot of things are at play because it's not just like in a bubble. All these bubbles are interacting with these bubbles, even though it's in a bubble. A lot of bubble, bubbles like self bubble, <laughs> they self contaminate. It's kind of interesting, but it's it's a, it's about both. Warrior movement as we know it. Sargon was already months into criticizing Anita Sarkeesian by the time Gamergate took off, and once she became extremely infamous for her relation to the movement, Sargon reaped its benefits. He began uploading videos almost daily and became such a prominent face of Gamergate that he was the one who got interviewed when BBC Radio covered it. However, BBC only played a fraction of their conversation, which prompted Sargon to upload the original, unedited interview in full on his channel. In it, he challenged the notion that Gamergate was a harassment campaign against women in gaming, something that many journalists had suggested. The fact that the BBC edited this specific part out certainly gave the impression that that's the narrative the media wanted to preserve and Sargon's objection to it was very appealing to his audience. By January of 2015, he had over 50,000 subscribers. While he avoided talking about his personal life, he began a relationship with the person he eventually married and had kids with. He became one of the de facto leaders of the skeptic community and often collaborated with other content creators who were a part of the same sphere. But however relevant all of this was online, it didn't translate into real world politics that much. But everything changed when Donald Trump announced his candidacy in June 2015, an event that instantly became reviled by... Everything did change. My life changed. Like, not to make it personal... But as a content creator who's in this space talking to these people, my life changed during these years. Like, it became significantly different for everybody in the space. And I knew, and again, this is always my problem, is like I never fit into spaces because I can't keep the same shtick going 
That's why I think this is so interesting that YouTubers like this can keep their shit going. Like, people literally keep narratives going. And I don't know. Are you just comfortable? Are you not being introspective? Like, how are you not changing? Like, how are you still making the same content 12 years later? And it's because, like, they're comfortable in that bubble. And that breeds success because your audience knows what to expect from you. And it's consistent. And it feels good. But that's also a sign of stagnation, which is interesting. So this, oh, man, what a time on the internet. What a time for hopeful to Britney who thought, oh, if we could just all get along and understand each other. And I'm like, none of these people want to understand each other. They want to win. That's what politics is about. They don't want to understand each other. Journalists and celebrated by all people who hated journalists, which happened to include Gamer Gators and consequently Sargon himself. As political commentators like Milo Yiannopoulos and Ben Shapiro skyrocketed in popularity Ugh. due to how gigantic libtards getting owned compilations became, Sargon <gasps> was one of these ships that got lifted by that rising tide. Oh my god, doesn't it feel like a time machine? This was all of our YouTube. Now, what's all of our YouTube? Boys and girls and dating and all that stuff, but like it's the same, it's just rebranded. This was our life on the internet. That's why I say like, I've been on the internet a long time and I've been in it making content and it's amazing. Like it's kind of amazing to see this replayed out as like old history lore when for a lot of us, it was just like our twenties. Already been making Ooh. fun of Tumblrinas for two years at that point, and suddenly all of his content backlog started getting traction. Throughout 2015, he was growing a lot, and he got up to 200,000 subscribers. And I guess due to his content having gotten so political, he must. Yo, Maya, thank you for joining memberships. I appreciate you. Let's go. Thank you. I appreciate you. Must have thought it was a good idea to start participating in debates. The only problem with that being that just because you're a good YouTuber doesn't mean you're a good debater. His first attempt at it was against leftist journalist Michael Brooks, who simply and repeatedly tried to get him to define what the term regressive left meant, a task that Sargon really struggled to do since he was used to just saying that term to his audience and having them connect the dots. Ah, good times. The Majority Report, also someone I used to watch chronically. J-Man in the audience didn't know my old lore. I'll give you a new one. You said the only people I watched from the time were Sargon and some black guy. I have collabed with both of those people. In person, we worked together uh, at a conference. I moderated a debate between some black guy and Carl and I were at the same campaigns and Carl has like shouted me out. And I've talked to him because Carl did. Carl, Benjamin of Sargon, told me one day you won't be a feminist. And he was right, but for the wrong reasons. He was right when I debated him, right? Like, but for the wrong reasons. He's right. I didn't stay a feminist. Uh, but I didn't become a conservative. I became more of a progressive. Feminism was too tame for me. <laughs> on what he was trying to articulate. <laughs> the debate turned into a one-sided confrontation with Michael Brooks on the offensive and Sargon seemingly doing his best to dodge and change the subject. His performance was so bad that some of his fans came out against him, trying to coach him into debating people better. Maybe he should have taken them up on that offer since about a month later, he debated yet another public figure, Christy Winters, one of the few prominent feminist people who stuck around in the atheist Ugh. community after the anti- I am so glad I don't do politics anymore. It was so exhausting. What? I am so glad... I'm not in politics anymore. What a miserable, that was my worst time on YouTube. I was the most depressed when I was in the political part of YouTube. Those people do not want to understand you. They don't. They only care about winning. Debate bros, politics. Oh my gosh. What a, this is like memory lane over here. SJW wave started. He also performed quite poorly in this debate to the point where he recognized as much in the after debate video. Regardless of these hiccups, he continued to grow steadily, and around the time this debate took place, he was making a thousand bucks per upload off of Patreon. While he'd mostly been covering political developments in the US, by mid-2016, the same kind of controversies made their way across the pond as the Brexit movement took off. In a nutshell, Brexit was the proposal for Britain to leave the European Union, something Sargon extensively covered and supported. And from that point onward, Sargon's primary focus was getting people to vote yes on it. Whatever aspirations he'd had regarding different kinds of content went completely out the window, including his game Necromancer answer, which was canceled and refunded to everyone who donated to his Kickstarter. Mm. He was now not only being an online influence on American politics, but actively participating in his own country's political process. Stop it. Maya says, I haven't watched Sargon since 2014. I wonder if Thunderfo Thunderfoot will get mentioned. When I say, and I know I'm not bragging, I'm just saying like how small the world is and how you don't know. This is why I was shocked when like certain people don't overlap. I've I don't know Thunderfoot very well. I've talked to him like on the phone one time because I was friends with somebody else who was friends with him, but I don't know him and like we didn't have a connection or anything. But the world is so small. Like it was so small. And it's because if you know, you know, but if you don't, you don't. That's why I'm shocked that I didn't have overlap with other content creators. I was like, we know all the same people, but like we didn't do the same things. Like I never tried to make a career as a debater. I only, I tried to make a creator, a uh, career as a person in politics, but then it was just unfulfilling because like nobody gave a fuck. 
Everyone's just trying to win the debate. How boring is that, you know? However, while he was paying attention to domestic affairs, they weren't really the right kind, since on July 3rd, during one of Sargon's many streams, he inadvertently shows a Facebook message he'd just received from his wife, saying, mm. Question, why can't you help yourself when it comes to flirting with women? Just a couple of days after the whole booth thing, you messaged a f***ing transgender- What? 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 Reef, what, what? process. However, while he was paying attention to domestic affairs, they weren't really the right kind, since on July 3rd, during one of Sargon's many streams, he inadvertently shows a Facebook message. He I do not know this lore. I do not know this lore. <gasps> I do not know this lore. What? He just received from his wife, saying, question, why can't you help yourself when it comes to flirting with women? Just a couple of days after the whole booth thing, you messaged a f***ing transgender telling them how good looking they are. What the f*** is your problem? Clearly cannot trust you. This stream is still up on YouTube for <laughs> whatever reason. Sargon never even went through the trial. When trans people say all of your favorites are in my DMs, I believe them. When trans people, especially trans women, say all your favorites, all your anti-trans favorites are in my DMs, I believe them. That was so funny. Wait, Ingrid says Amazing Atheist was my homie. Wait, you didn't know who I was during those days? Did you never see us have crossover? This is what I'm saying. Did you never see that? Like, Amazing Atheist even shouted me out. Like, you didn't know who I was at the time? <laughs> um, oh, I've always been a small content creator. But damn, uh, that's so funny. This is so hilarious. I never knew this lore. Trouble of cutting that part out with a YouTube editor. I have no idea who this transgender person yeah. is or what the booth thing is supposed to wow. be. But uh, none of this sounds particularly kosher. Fortunately for him, this moment went by mostly unnoticed to the point where I'd safely guess most people who know him have no idea this ever happened. And honestly, it's not that big of a deal. It's just like, <laughs> why? As the American elections approached, Sargon was doing his best to simultaneously cover Brexit and turn his pro-Trump content up a notch, capitalizing oh. on the massive media phenomenon it was at the time. When Trump won, Sargon celebrated by ironically posting a compilation of clips of Akilah, obviously, a mm. Hillary supporting online personality to mock her we're gonna come back to this later 2017 she's so pretty i love her she's so pretty i stopped watching her years ago but she's so pretty he started off on the wrong foot sargon got suspended from twitter for unspecified reasons soon after when he tried using a secondary account he quickly found out it was also suspended also for reasons not made immediately clear eventually in a stream he revealed that while his main account status was still unexplained his alt got suspended because he dm'd clips of two men being extremely affectionate with one another to someone who was pretending to be him on twitter sargon's explanation was that in one of the replies this person made they claimed the images didn't bother him since he actually loved the male apparatus. Eventually, Twitter lifted his suspension and he returned to Twitter without issue, which is important because Twitter was the catalyst for the next development in his career. In January of 2017, he noticed that the British government had very loose criteria for what constituted an ethnicity and suggested he'd register sh posters as an ethnicity, which was promptly identified with the Kekistani nationality. For context, Kek initially came about as what the text filter in World of Warcraft produced when a player with a horde character typed out lol, which is also how Koreans type out laughter. It was mm. casually adopted by 4chan users until in the lead up to the 2016 election, people discovered it was the name of the Egyptian deity of primordial darkness, which had the head of a frog. This, in turn, was instantly associated with Pepe the Frog, who at the time was being framed as a symbol of the alt-right, and it was embraced as such by some 4chan users. When a post happened- Yo, I love humans. I love lore. This is so cool. To get repeating numbers and a signature code, CAC would be praised. And the concept of meme magic got brought up as something that could manifest Trump's presidency into reality. All in all, it's just a massive internal joke that spiraled into something much larger than initially intended, but it became a reliable identifier of who was in the know. This immediately became one of Sargon's main gimmicks and played a significant role in transforming an internal poll meme with little to no relevance outside of 4chan into a huge phenomenon. Soon after, the hashtag Free Kekistan started going viral on Twitter, with other political commentators engaging with it, and even some mainstream media articles written about it. It's important to say that the epic he will not divide us stream started just 10 days before these i'm you know just a reminder guys like if i know everybody in this sphere that's how small the sphere is this illusion that there's so many content creators out there we all belong in bubbles and there's only so many niches for us to thrive in that's why you know everybody eventually everybody who is going to do something with it a lot of people try to make a career on youtube but like you're not going to do anything with it lots of people who end up doing something with it like look as small as i've always been and maybe never as famous i make money and I make good money. I make okay money. I do pretty damn good for somebody who's like so small. But also I'm established and I get to do this full time. And I do know everybody. Maybe we're not friends, but man, I've really had opportunities. Like, and that's the thing is like, you don't need a lot to have the opportunity. You need a lot to have the career though. You need a lot of dedication. 
going back to the difference between a job and a career is a lot of these people aren't on YouTube anymore because like either their careers ended or it was just a job to them. Carl, as far as I know, with the Lotus and everything, like he's still pretty active. I don't watch him, but I know that he also wanted to create something bigger on YouTube where it wasn't just about him, but it was about like a brand. But 2016 on YouTube was so interesting, but it was also so specific to the niche. And notice that none of these people are like very famous. This is a very niche video about a niche bubble on YouTube. Do you know what I'm saying? Like this is a niche these people are not famous. Even though Carl went into politics, he's not famous. He's not like Brad Pitt famous. He's not even big YouTuber famous. And that's the thing we all have to remember is like they might be names we know here on this little bubble, but this is a little bubble. You know, Chachi says, I've never heard of any of these people, but Brittany has become a fave. Let's go. Let's go. It's just interesting. I just like put it into perspective this is not very far from any of us. So this says, I found out about you during your BDSM through Evie Lupine. Actually, I think that was much after your political career. Uh, it was kind of after, but also overlapped a bit. And then I officially left both of those bubbles because it was just like, there was always a cap. There's always a cap. You have to really do the same content every day. And even in politics, whether it was YouTube or traditional, I was always told you have to pick a script and stick to it. And I just don't want to. And that's the thing about politics. It's a script. It's the most script script ever. And if you're neurodivergent, it hits that sense of justice you have and it gives you a script to follow. And I just like, it feels like a lie because it is. So much of, of this is a lie. And they're too passionate about hating people while talking about freedom. Everybody in politics loves to rant about how free they want the world while screaming about how they want to take away your rights. It's too much of an oxymoron for me. It's just too much. Tweets from Sargon. So Shia LaBeouf had made the perfect storm. Throughout 2017, Kekistan got a national anthem and perhaps most importantly, elected the illustrious big man Tyrone as its representative. Admittedly, the hype died down pretty hard in the following years as people on 4chan became dissatisfied with how watered down and normified Kekistan became. Still, while it was at its peak of popularity, Sargon was at its helm. However, not all things were positive, even during the so-called good times. The skeptic community, which was still something near and dear to Sargon at the time, found itself embroiled in one controversy after another. Mm -hmm. For starters, about about a year prior began the candid controversy in which some of Sargon's associates, oh. mainly armored skeptic and sh That was Matt Mundane. For starters, about a year prior began the candid controversy in which some of Sargon's- This is Matt Mundane. I knew him back in the day too. He fucked up royally. He fucked his fans over. He fucked his reputation over. And I remember because I was at an event with him and he picked a fight, ended up fighting with one of the girls I was with at the event because he made a video- lying about her and lying about her reputation and she noticed him she goes aren't you the guy who made videos about me and he was like uh, 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 uh. Sargon's associates mainly armored skeptic and shoe head got into hot water for for the record that is not armored skeptic that is matt mundane so promoting an Ended controversy in which that is Matt Mund that is not Armored Skeptic. That is not what Armored Skeptic looks like. That's Matt Mundane. He got the wrong face. Armored Skeptic looks very different. And shout out to all the people who've seen my shoe on head and Armored Skeptic collaboration. That's private now, but that's that's not Armored Skeptic. That's Matt Mundane. Some of Sargon's associates, mainly Armored Skeptic and Shuan Head, got into hot water for promoting an app called Candid. Marketed as a kind of early alt-tech platform for the anonymous discussion of controversial topics. The only problem is, unbeknownst to their audiences, and apparently even to the content creators promoting it, the marketing was completely contrary to what the app actually did. Not only did the app allegedly collect and sell your data, which, despite sounding spooky, is just par for the course as far as apps go, and probably 100% of the apps you have do that, but it also wasn't really a free speech app since it did have moderation done by an AI to prevent slander and hate speech which had the potential of being even more censorship friendly than regular means of communication, since the AI relied on user input and reports to ban people, something that could easily be abused and manipulated. Most of this was brought to people's attention by a YouTuber called Harmful Opinions, who spoke out about it multiple times and eventually discussed it on a live stream with Sargon. It didn't go too well, since Harmful was characterized as someone gratuitously purity testing the skeptic community, which from his perspective wasn't the case. Overall, Harmful had the opinion that the skeptics swept the candid can of worms under the rug as hard as possible, with relative success since none of them lost their credibility as a consequence. Harmful Opinions saw it as a classic case 
case of people getting paid to not look under the hood and promote something blindly, then avoiding accountability when called out on it. Sardon's mm -hmm. point at least seemed to be that being as confrontational as harmful was would lead to a fracture in the community, and they needed to stick together. Even if he was being completely sincere, Sardon's wishes for a united skeptic community wouldn't materialize since in 2017, another founding member of the skeptic community, mm -hmm. Thunderfoot, decided to announce his departure. According to him, the anti-SJW movement was becoming a parody of itself, citing one specific instance of Sargon, among other skeptics, making fun of an incident in which one of the members of the channel, The Skeptic Feminist, shot and killed a woman. Uh, well, the feminist oh. got triggered. To mm -hmm. the final time. But I, I want to say, can I, can I praise the shooter really quick? <laughs> Most of Thunderfoot's video was directed at Sargon since he was one of the biggest voices associated with it, and soon after, Sargon replied with a video titled, Never Outshine the Master. In it, he accuses Thunderfoot of deliberately misrepresenting the point of his stream, providing more stream highlights to prove his point, including times when he had a more sober discussion about the shooter. While the audience mostly accepted Sargon's explanation, Thunderfoot did not, and doubled down with another video two days later, mostly reiterating what had already been said. Sargon came out with another video countering Thunderfoot the same day. This was basically the, uh, the skeptic community's Kendrick Lamar versus Drake. Oh my god, stop it. But it's so true. Drama with people who live in their mom's basements but have big egos. Look, all of us are functioning adults, and yet all of us think we're way more important than we are. And that's the problem with YouTube. That is the problem with YouTube. And that's why it's interesting to see people try to become like more mainstream. Because I'm like, that's a different career path. Being a YouTuber and being mainstream are two different career paths. Like, you got to understand that, right? Like, that's very specific. And so it is kind of interesting to watch these people. Like, I got such a big ick. This is basically around the time I was, like, moving out of the communities. I was like, should I even be on YouTube anymore? I am so glad I pivoted to what I do now. It is so much better. Oh, my God. It is so much better. But Jesus, these people... They continued to go back and forth fruitlessly for a little while until Sargon bowed out, seeing that most people had sided with him in the conflict, and saw what he said in the first stream as a joke in poor taste and nothing else. As far as public spats went, this was the first one he could confidently Carl has a lot. He is known for making a lot of jokes people didn't like, right? Discord said, I can't believe I used to watch all these people. I can't believe I used to watch these people and want to collab with these people and like thought we could all do collaborations together all the time. The drama was insane in these communities say he won, meaning he was batting one to three. But VidCon was coming up, and Sargon had the brilliant idea of playing to his strengths and poking a little bit of fun at Anita Sarkeesian, only this oh time God. it would be in real life. I was there. I was in the audience for this. Oh my God, memory lane. I was in the audience for this event, and it was weird, and the energy was so tense, and it was just like a lot. It was a lot, and I was here for this audience. Like, I was here for this event. I wonder if you'll see my hair. I remember feeling like so tense because all the boys showed up. So we were sitting in the audience and from my right side, I see it. All the boys show up and you can just tell shit's about to happen and it's about to be so fucking uncomfortable and I don't know what's about to happen. And I just remember thinking like, oh no, I don't like this energy. This energy is fucking weird. And it was weird. You could just tell they came with an intent to fuck shit up. During a panel of hers about cyberbullying, Sargon decided to occupy front row seats so that she could see him. And she reacted, as you would expect. You're making these dumb videos that just say the same over and over again. And like, I hate to give you attention because you're a garbage human. As much as they made fun of her, being publicly acknowledged by Anita, and even better, having her do so while evidently angry, meant they stood to get a lot more clout. It was around this point in time that the commentary community was also thriving, and many channels inherited wow. the skeptics' crusade against feminists. Many people, wow. Sargon included, addressed the situation and called on Hank and John Green, who had organized the event, to punish Anita for technically attacking an audience member. However, the Green brothers confirmed- Wait, why is he showing I'm Alex? Which is interesting, since Alex is now in controversy. Why is he showing I'm Alex? What does I'm Alex have to do- Did I miss something here? Oh, Anita Sargeesian calls Sargon a garbage human being. I was there for that. Classic. The skeptics crusade against feminists. Many people, Sargon included, addressed the situation and called on Hank and John Green, who had organized the event, to punish Anita for technically attacking an audience member. However, the Green brothers confirmed she would face no consequences. Well That's why it was annoying. That's why I didn't respect Carl. And I still don't respect a lot of people in this space. You, I was there. You purposely showed up with very malicious energy to make a scene to go famous and popular. They were no better than the bullshit people who just wanted attention. He's no better than Kim Kardashian. I remember being in the audience for this in real real life. And Carl and all of them came to fuck shit up. And then they were like, I can't believe people are calling me a shit human being. And I'm like, you know you're being a shit human being. What part of this is appropriate? Like, what part of what you're doing is appropriate? This is not okay. But of course, 
it was YouTube and it was all about viewership. But for him to then cry to John and Hank for more attention, it was the beginning of me realizing like YouTubers suck. Like you guys suck. This is sucky behavior. But also it's a big part of some boy bubbles. This is a very specific boy bubble. That's why for these big debate bros to literally act the way they act and then to throw a tantrum when people are like, I don't think you're like the greatest person. They're like, oh, what? And I remember Carl making a joke. I'm sure Tom will talk about it, about the I wouldn't even grape you comment. I'm sure he's going to bring it up. I was there for the audience of them bringing that up at MythCon. And I remember feeling so tense about it because the audience was so gross, like the energy of the audience. So again, all these men want to act like they're very like safe spaces for women. But like the way you joke and the way you act is questionable. Also, to be fair, shout out to all the times Carl Benjamin uh, has been nice to me. Carl and I have been very nice and, and very normal towards each other over the years. But at the same time, I really, even to this day, do not like his opinions on things. I think he has bad bubble takes, but you know, it's a bubble whatsoever. This made people pretty mad, but not as much as when Boogie posted a video retelling his experience with Anita at VidCon, in which he claimed that after a panel both of them participated in ended, she took him aside and berated him for having a closing statement that put feminists and skeptics on equal grounds of legitimacy. I don't remember exactly what she said, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but she said in a very upset that I think it was very f***ing uncool that you said what you said there at the end, knowing that no one else would have enough time to respond. I bet you can imagine how that affected my anxiety because the exact focal point of my anxiety for the entire weekend, in fact for the last six weeks, the nightmare scenario that I was terrified of actually had come true. I'd upset somebody who I very, very much had tried to not upset and did not want to upset. Well, it may seem unthinkable nowadays, during this time, Boogie had a reputation as the Mr. Rogers of YouTube, which made people extra infuriated against Anita. This was a mass- Shout out to Daniel, Mr. Epsion. He and I also go way back. Oh my God, what a bubble, bro. See, Daniel's been to my house a lot for lunch and dinner and stuff. We used to do collabs back in the day. And in Seattle, since we both lived in Washington, he would come over to do collabs and things. Massive win for Sargon, since after half a decade of antagonizing her, the general public had come to his side. Sargon eventually talked about the situation on the Joe Rogan experience, and though it's true that at the time it was relatively easier- Insane that he was on the Joe Rogan experience. That's so funny. ...to get on there, it still meant an amount of prestige that had been afforded to very few people, especially YouTubers. On the topic of Anita Sarkeesian, this meant total Sargon victory. However, things took a turn for the worse when, about two months later, Akila obviously happened upon that one compilation Sargon posted in the wake of Trump's victory, and proceeded to take the video down for copyright. When Sargon decided Disputed the takedown, Akila sued him. Tensions around the topic of copyright reform were already. This is very scary for content creators. So, like, if somebody claims a copyright on my video and I say I'm allowed to use it, and they find out I was not allowed to use it, I get a strike on my account and I can get have my account terminated. So, when like my my original video about um girls, like why do grown women dress like little girls? That video has a clip inside of it that had to get cut out because I got basically the same thing on my video, which was like, hey we don't want you to use this. And I was like, yeah, but I want to use it. But if I dispute it, then I run the risk of getting my channel terminated and or they can sue me. So it's not worth it to like fight it. But that's that's the thing is you run that risk. Or maybe if you're lucky, they'll pay attention to you. And then all of a sudden you're friends and you're doing collaborations, which is probably not what's going to happen. So as a content creator, you've got to be, um, you got to be aware of that high since the Ethan Klein versus Matt Haas case had just happened, in which Matt sued Ethan for reacting to his videos. While many creators covered this, Sargon remained pretty quiet on the topic, probably because his lawyer advised him to do so. Due to international ramifications, since Sargon was in the UK and Aquila was in the US, this case didn't look so great from the get-go. But we'll come back to this topic later. In early October, he took part in a debate at MythCon 2017 against a certain male feminist called Thomas Smith. And finally, Sargon evened his score. For context, a good chunk of this debate- I was in the audience for this as well. I was sitting next to Shu. June and I were sitting next to each other for this conversation. I believe this was the conversation. I could be wrong, but I almost think this, I, th I, I know I was in the audience for sure because I was here for this event, but I think this is the, this is the moment that Shu and I were sitting next to each other. Maybe, I think. Shu was really nice to me that weekend, but I think this is that event. But yeah, I was here for this. Bait is centered around a tweet that Sargon made, tagging the then British MP Jess Phillips, saying that he wouldn't even her. His audience thought this was hilarious and began replicating Sargon's tweet, which was spun by the media as 600 threats. However, in Sargon's words, all 600 were exactly the opposite, saying specifically that they wouldn't do it. See? See? Did you hear that? Just a her. His audience thought. Do you see that? Sorry, it's moving too quickly for me.
Smith Smith. And finally, Sargon evened his score. For context, a good chunk of this debate is centered around a tweet that Sargon made tagging yeah. the then- This, I was sitting next to Shu because I remember getting so much anxiety from how the audience reacted to him having this conversation with him. And I was like, my anxiety was through the roof. I was fine, but like, oh my God, like the way this audience reacted felt so threatening to me. It was so weird. And British MP Jess Phillips saying that he wouldn't even her. I wouldn't even grape you. It was gross. It was really gross. And this is when Carl started to change and get a little bit better was after this event, in my opinion. But Carl still, in my opinion, again, we fundamentally disagree. I don't want anything bad to happen to Carl ever, but um, gross, right? Like gross behavior, so gross. I wouldn't wish, like this is just so lacking of dignity. His audience thought this was hilarious and began replicating Sargon's tweet, which was spun by the media as 600 threats. However, in Sargon's words, all 600 were exactly the opposite, saying specifically that they wouldn't do it. Sargon was eventually confronted about it, prompting him to double down and say, there's been an awful lot of talk about whether I would or wouldn't go gorilla mode on Jess Phillips. I suppose with enough pressure, I might cave, but let's be honest, nobody's got that much beer. Thomas mistakenly assumed Gross that bringing this up during the debate would put Sargon on the defense, a position he's known to not be good at fighting from, but instead the exact opposite happened. He saw fit to, to tweet at her, to say yep. to her, I wouldn't even you. Yep. And do you understand, do you understand why your moral outrage about that is something I just don't care about? It turns out taking this stance wasn't a great strategy as it made the entire audience turn against Thomas. One less known part of the story is that after the debate, one of Thomas's friends decided to engage with Sargon about this yet again after the event was done, yielding similar results or lack thereof. This winning streak pumped up Sargon's ego a bit. He was like, hey, I'm good at debates, only for him to find himself on Andy Worski's podcast debating yeah. none other than the white- uh, Andy Worski was one of the worst things to happen to YouTube at this time. Richard Spencer was bad too nationalist Richard Spencer. Yeah, the uh, the guy that got punched. This is a stupid position to find yourself in in the first place because if you beat a guy like that in a debate, it's not like you get hailed for it since he's such a hated figure in the first place. But if you lose, you make him and consequently his position look kind of good. The debate lasted a whopping four hours during which Sargon often resorted to being hostile and snarky while Spencer put on an air of professionalism and amicability and spoke as articulately as he could, mm -hmm. resulting in a lot of people saying that Spencer won, despite his position being pretty <laughs> hard to defend. Sargon, I so am I'm not going to say something that you. might be the most insulting thing we've ever heard. I will accept a you you think, together. Do you <laughs> think that you are more intelligent than you are? And that's actually a really tricky place to be. One of Sargon's longtime objectives, and part of why he frequently engaged in slap fights with alt-right people in the first place, was because he wanted to set himself apart from far-right ideologies. Soon after the Spencer debate, he posted a video in which he reflected on it and revealed his intention to turn his up-until-then exclusively online platform into a real-life political movement. He was made fun of for this, but didn't relent, and proceeded to register a website for his activist group, The Liberalists, supposed to represent the principles of British classic liberalism. Mm. The whole platform quickly fell apart as only two streams were ever made pushing for it before Sargon himself discontinued it, even if not officially. However, this wasn't the end of his political aspirations. Later on in 2018, Sargon followed his friend Count Dankula's lead and joined the United Kingdom Independence Party, or UKIP for short. While it was a very small party for most of its existence, Brexit catapulted it into prominence. Though after that same referendum that Sargon was promoting was successful, it started losing steam. That is, until British online personalities began joining. Sargon, Count Dankula, Paul Joseph Watson, and others were Ugh. now actively promoting the party on their YouTube channels, causing the party membership to grow by five hundred people. Their entry into UKIP coincided with the controversial Articles 11 and 13, Ew. which were EU propositions to put more pressure on social media platforms to prevent copyright violations with more supervision over everything users upload, which could mean a whole host of different but equally ominous interpretations of the law that don't favor YouTubers. This should have been a relatively easy fight to pick since many people were reasonably afraid of what could happen if those propositions passed. However, when the time came to do a conference regarding these topics, virtually no one showed up to watch them speak. Despite this, Sargon felt that he'd been legitimized as a political figure. And what did he do next? Hash out some grudges with people he'd beefed with online. You can leave YouTube drama, but YouTube drama doesn't leave you. Specifically, he went after Jim Medeker, who had been one of the many people who mocked and put down his original liberalist movement concept, among other smaller bits of conflicts that ultimately led to a planned live stream of Sargon's called Hello Jim. The thing is, this stream was announced a few days in advance, allowing Jim to plan ahead so he could react to it live. In a clever move, Sargon started the stream a few hours ahead of schedule, when it would oh. be early morning in the UK, but the middle of the night for oh. Jim, meaning he wouldn't be able to catch it while it was still on. And oh! Oh, 40 chess, bro, 40 chess. Not so clever move by Sargon. He left the chat off and forgot his microphone was muted for the first 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, he had a Boomer Britney moment. Oh, he had a Boomer Britney moment. Fuck. ...of the stream, just talking away at the void. Following this up with even- Holy fuck, that's so funny. 
Holy shit, that's so good, bro. Yo, try to play 4D chess with your enemy just to have yourself muted for the first 20 minutes. Yo, that is funny. Fuck. More stupidity. Once his mic was on, Sargon went on a rant about Medicare being an all-around bad person based on things he saw on 4chan and Kiwi Farms. The low light of this stream was when Sargon suggested Jim was a groomer based on a low-quality audio recording of him talking to a 17-year-old who was dating a 14-year-old. If this sounds like a nothing burger, it's because it pretty much is. No, Cass, no! Uh, Cass, no. Canceled. No. I don't want that humor in my audience because if you start doing it, then the people who aren't in our audience will start doing it. No, 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 canceled, no, canceled, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 I have to delete it, girl, I have to delete it, I do not want Sargon humor in my chat, okay, maybe on the Discord where I know it's a safe space, but not on the YouTube chat, YouTube chat is not a safe space, okay, YouTube chat, the, the, the trolls will come in and think they can talk to me like that, you can't talk to me like that, only my Discord can, because my Discord's, those people actually like me. I won't be able to tell the difference between trolls otherwise. Is, and Sargon made himself look like a fool, even to his own audience. Additionally, he accused Medicare of lying about suffering from autoimmune disease and cancer in order to get sympathy donations on Patreon, again, based purely on speculation. The stream ended up getting massively dislike bombed as people sided with Medicare before he'd even made a response to Sargon's stream, mostly because of how flimsy Sargon's evidence was. When Mr. Medicare did go live, despite taking their beef a lot less seriously than Sargon did and spending the majority of time simply making fun of him, he had an easy time defending himself from the accusations. The recorded conversation Sargon used to accuse Jim of being a groomer, for example. Yeah, geez, Sargon, it makes you think, why would Jim be talking to this guy about dating an underage boy across state lines? Maybe it's because we had a, a sneaking suspicion that our 17-year-old was actually 19 years old and that he was bragging about having nude pics of uh, underage boys on his fucking cell phone. And maybe the reason the call is recorded, you unbelievably dumb motherfucker, is because we were going to fuck with him, get it on as evidence, and then send it to his fucking family. This certainly made more sense than whatever Sargon was trying to imply, and the fact that this pretty serious claim was made without any rigor on the part of Sargon severely damaged his reputation. Whereas Sargon was previously seen as someone who argues in good faith, even if he occasionally fumbles a debate or gets a little high and mighty, people were now seeing he could be petty and dishonest, even actively malicious. While this didn't hurt his prospects in his political career per se, it showed that despite the more professional direction Sargon was going, he retained the reckless behavior of a YouTuber. For example, he continued to engage with the Killstream, one of the main hubs of terminally online miscreants and alt-right lolcows, including its owner, Ethan Ralph, who became notorious online for, among many other things, being convicted of distributing revenge porn of the woman who had become the mother of his child. Oh. Not exactly the kind of company and aspiring politics. I missed this lore. I don't know who this is. Petition should be keeping, to say the least. However, it wasn't his direct involvement that became an issue, but the possibility he'd been trying to get it taken down. It's hard to explain Sargon's relationship with the so-called alt-right, since, while he frequently antagonized them openly, which is far from impressive since it's completely okay to dunk on those guys, he also seemed to want their approval and engage with them much more than necessary. For context, in late 2018, the kill- the, I've noticed this about certain debate bros. You'll notice that they will hang out with people they disagree with more, like- their enemies because it actually boosts views for both of them, but then they kind of become each other. I've noticed that, like I've noticed the reason I didn't like debate circles is like if you debate your enemy long enough to make money together, you will become similar to one another. And usually you become more like your enemy than they become like you, which sounds like, like how does that happen? You guys, you go more centrist is what I'm trying to say, or more far right together. Because again, even being able, that's why some leftists won't engage with conservatives because at some point they're so bad faith. It's like engaging with you feels dishonest. But to be fair, lots of political people, progressive or not, are bad faith because they're not interested in like finding the nuance or bridging the gap. And I learned this when I was like involved with all these people. As any time I tried to get my foot in the door, they didn't like the compromise solutions I was coming up with. Every time I tried to get into politics, I was like, where's the compromise? They were like, no compromise. And I was like, well, that's confusing. How are we supposed to live in a world without compromise? Like as a society, these people don't want compromise. They want to win. And that's why I'm even careful now about taking collaborations because I noticed that they feel validated. Like people feel validated when you engage with certain kinds of people and you're like, huh, like I don't, I'm not trying to validate you, but at the same time, there, I'm trying to be like, uh, I'm trying to compromise about us existing in the same space together, but I don't, I'm not here to validate you. I'm here to compromise, which is different, but it's hard. How do you compromise with people without them feeling validated and what they're doing? It, you know,
Stream raised almost 30 grand for charity, only for the funds to get held by YouTube, followed by the kill stream getting taken off the platform. This is directly related to an article in the Wall Street Journal about how far-right personalities on the platform flew under the radar of TOS violations by having these super chats say crazy stuff instead of saying it themselves. And the writer of that article had reached out to Ralph and let him know his streams were going to be used as an example. His fans did not take this lightly, as they started spamming the journalist in question with mean tweets, resulting in her privating her account. Ralph tried to Damn. do the kill stream through the channel of one of his regulars, Zidane, but that was also taken down. The next day, all of his associated channels were removed, and Ralph had to move his operation to stream.me. This attracted a lot of backlash, since it looked like journalists were trying to stop alt-right people from doing charity in fear it would make them look better. Soon after, the hashtag Wall Street Journal kids started making rounds on Twitter, and it's at this point that Sargon comes in. Shortly after Ethan had been banned, people speculated Sargon had used one of his dummy accounts to post an inflammatory tweet mocking Ralph getting banned, and suggesting that one of his associates, Andy Worski, should suffer the same punishment. Some people even expressed their suspicions that Sargon actually had something to do with the ban itself, with a particular focus on one of his associates who went by the name of Kraut. Kraut was exposed for having a Discord server in which he hosted doxes of far-right people, so it wasn't too far-fetched of a theory, even if it wasn't really supported by anything. To settle this, Sargon gets invited to the kill stream, and during it, more tweets from this alt account get shown that further established that Sargon had it in for the kill stream and one of the eyes of advertisers on it. What is that yeah. tweet about? Can you not figure that out? Sargon does qualify that his objective in bringing it up was to get ads taken off of Twitter, whatever that means, not to take them off the air, but still, it didn't bode well for him. Still, he insisted he had nothing to do with it. When the topic of Kraut's doxing came up, Sargon became pretty vague about his degree of awareness as to what Kraut was up to, but he maintained that he consistently told him it wasn't worth it to go yacht for yacht, riz for riz with all writers, advising him not to do bad things, whatever they may be. Look, I told you, I didn't know what Kraut was doing on his server because I never went on his server. I became under the impression that he was doing bad things. So I was like, Kraut, if you're doing bad things, don't do bad things. And then this whole thing Storm happens, it turns out Crown didn't really do anything. So it, now, I mean, like, a lot of you guys owe Crown an apology. I mean, you understand that, right? They showed a post of his in which he expressed he personally didn't care if Jim or Ralph suffered these attacks since he disliked them, but there's not much proof beyond that that Sargon had any hand in the actual bannings. While Sargon managed to defend himself... Mm. You know, this is the one thing about social media. I saw this uh, social media post. I don't remember who it was, but it was basically, like, there was tea happening. Oh, it was Nara. It was Nara... Nora, what's her name? Nara, whatever her name is, Nara Smith on TikTok. Apparently, Nara liked a TikTok of another girl who accused Nara of copying her. I actually think Nara's innocent in this drama. Not that it matters, and I'm not going to cover it. But this original content creator was like, you know who I am. You liked one of my posts. And Nara's like, I don't know who you are. And Nara made a really, uh, another woman made a comment about Nara, made a really good point, which is something that happens to me where I just like things all the time but I don't know people or sometimes I'll like a video or sometimes you'll say like, oh, I really like this content creator. And then you're like, oh my God, what? It's like, you don't always know everything about them. This happened to Ethan a while back, H3H3, where Ethan liked something academics did and then academics got a woman accusing him of drugging her and assaulting, letting two men assault her at his home. And Ethan's like, holy fuck, I just said I like this guy. It's like, you think you can say it's safe to say I like a content creator and then you're like, holy fuck, how do you think I feel with like the bridge burnings and stuff? It's like you want to like content creators and then you find out they're like shitty people behind closed doors and you're like, oh my God. And you're all here for people making mistakes. But every time you say this is a nice person or a good person, you risk someone in your life engaging with them and contracting an STI or getting pregnant or getting cheated on or something. And you're like, oh my God, because you would think these people would tell people. But then they don't. And then it's like, uh, and then that's why I'm done. I'm done putting my name on any y'all's reputation. You all suck. All of you are probably bad people. Because every time you try to vouch for somebody, the shit that goes down, because people think, oh, well, if you're vouching for them, they must have similar values. I saw one clip of them and I thought they were funny. I met them one time and I thought they were funny. I don't know anything about these people. And what I know about them, you should already know they're messy. Don't engage. Asmin just covered a controversy with Dr. Disrespect saying that if Dr. Disrespect has a victim under his belt, right? If he has a victim under his belt, then we should come out and say that he's done this because we need to protect more victims. The dilemma is even if you warn people, they won't believe you. That's why it's not good for victims to come out because they won't believe you. Nobody believes you because nobody believes anything. Ali says, I, I think Nara in the Nara case, she actually commented on one of the girl's videos before, but that doesn't matter. I comment on people's shit all the time. I don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. Like with peace and love, I don't know who you are. I How many times do you guys ask me, do you know this YouTuber? And I was like, no, I don't know who they are. And then I'll look at their face and be like, oh yeah, I've watched like 20 of their videos. I will watch like 20 to 30 videos from a content creator and not know who they are. There are people on TikTok I like I know I watch, but I don't know their names. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know them. If you put a gun to my head and you're like, what's their name? I'd be like, I, I don't know. I just know what their content is. That I'm just letting people know. It's not like, oh, you definitely know who that is. Uh, unless I know, I do not know. Because knowing is not the same thing. Like knowing is very specific. It's like, oh, can you pass? Like, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Do you know these things? Or do you just remember them from school? Knowing something is different from remembering something. To remember something is maybe to associate it with something else, but like to know something, to answer it without having to, that's so different. So maybe that's how I took the Nara situation, but see, this is why I'm not commenting on it because like it was too, it's too much. But anyways. Later on in the stream, he reiterated his baseless belief that Jim was a groomer, and overall this debate, if we can even call it that, wasn't won by any side. Sargon wasn't satisfied though. He needed another L to close off the year. He asked to take part in a stream with Christy Winters to discuss the 2018 midterm elections. A pattern you might be picking up on is that Sargon doesn't really ever let go of grudges, and he struggles to move past things, oh. especially when it involves him losing some kind of competition. About two years after his debate with Christy, they go at it again, and once again, Sargon is simply unprepared, unable to provide specific answers and telling Christy to Google it when confronted. Not that debates are super important, but Sargon asked to get on the stream, so it doesn't really make sense that he wouldn't be prepared for it. Eventually, the stream just evolved into Christy and her co-host Kevin making fun of him for his uninformed chudness. Despite all of the hiccups and embarrassment he'd put himself through, he continued to grow steadily. At this point, his Patreon was raking in over 12 grand a month. However, that came to an abrupt end when, on December 6th, his page was taken down for, quote, using racist language. Comically, the amount of people on that side of the YouTube or that side of the sphere who got their Patreons taken down is insane. P.S. My Patreon is doing great because I follow TOS. You guys should join 18 plus because we discuss philosophy and I don't want to talk to your parents. OK, thank you. Join my Patreon, support the content. Let's get me up to 12K a month, guys. Let's go. I love it. You can follow me on Snapchat if you join Patreon or Discord. Let's go. Enough. In his video about the situation, Sargon showed that the specific violation he got kicked off of the platform for was when he referred to all right people as white N-words. Patreon's decision was very controversial. So much so that even mainstream voices like Sam Harris decided to close their account in protest of what happened. The main issue here was that Sargon had said what he said. When I was on Patreon at this time, Sargon got banned and some of my viewers overlapped with his audience because I told you we had collabed in the past, right? And I was the progressive feminist and he was like the conservative and we had overlap. So people in my audience unsubscribed from my Patreon because they were also protesting Patreon for taking Carl off the platform. And that is the point of why I offer different perks on different platforms. Also, the integration is difficult. Like I can't age I can't like verify your age through YouTube. My Discord's 18 plus. It's like I don't I separate these things for a reason, but Many people didn't want to support me on Patreon, but they wanted to support me somehow, so they wanted to give money to YouTube. Or there's people who hate YouTube, so they want to support me on Patreon. Look, if you want to see the continue, like the content continue, join me on these, on on these platforms. But know that there's a reason why some people don't want to use these platforms. And during that time, I did lose patrons because they didn't want to support the platform. Outside of Patreon, and the TOS is only supposed to apply to content behind the paywall. In an odd instance of deja vu, a few weeks after the fact, Sargon blamed Ethan Ralph for the whole thing, accusing him of running a false flagging campaign out of his Discord server. Ralph responded by saying that the Discord server Sargon was talking about had been dead and buried at that point and couldn't possibly have been the culprit. Ultimately, since the ban wasn't due to any particular piece of content behind the paywall, it's much more likely that they just made up an excuse to go and kick Sargon out for being too right-wing. Given Patreon's behavior toward other right-wing personalities around the same time, it wouldn't be too surprising. Still, as terrible as it is getting 12,000 less every month, Sargon had a lot on his plate. The next person to be included in the UKIP roster was Tommy Robinson, who had been convicted of interfering with a trial by recording a member of a Muslim gang who had been convicted of rape and was sentenced to a measly 12. Do you remember watching this in full time? I remember watching this in full time as well. Crazy. They just didn't understand why what he did was wrong. They thought they were protecting the rapists. Like, that's what's crazy is they thought they were protecting the rapists. So they needed to come out and come out against these guys, which impacted the trial. Like, you're going to impact the trial. That's why you're not allowed to do this is like they're afraid it will impact the trial, which might get these rapists off. And these guys kept thinking they were like being saviors of some kind. Oh, my gosh. 12 years. For doing this, he was branded a far-right agitator and spent 13 months in prison. So his addition to UKIP certainly attracted attention. UKIP was now full of controversial online personalities, unfortunately causing one of its senior members, Nigel Farage, to distance himself. But due to how many people joined the party as a consequence of that strategy, it was hard to see how this could be a bad thing. This began to change as Sargon's reputation soured, a souring which accelerated once a certain remark towards a British MP named Jess Phillips that I mentioned here previously resurfaced, resulting in this absolutely fire moment during a press conference. I would like to ask Carl Benjamin why you 
think it is acceptable to say on Twitter that you wouldn't even a female Labour MP? Oh, because I don't think when there are any different men in the way that we should treat them. Unlike the establishment, unlike our judges, who literally say, if you were a man, I would send you to jail, I think we should treat women the same as men. And that means if a woman is being a giant and laughing at male I'm going to be a giant back to her. Any questions? So it's acceptable? Yes! It is acceptable to speak about raping a woman. But this was just the tip of the iceberg. More clips resurfaced, one in which Sargon makes what many saw as controversial remarks about the age of consent. I was well under the age of 11 when I started having sex. And so what I like to do is put people on the uh, the other side of the argument. It's like, what you have to do is you have to say that someone like me, not anybody else but me, that I was too stupid to appreciate the nature and quality oh of what I was doing. Oh, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Please convince me I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, I think... Well, the, you know what it was so... You know what was interesting about this time? Let me tell you. They really thought they were doing something. They really thought... They were, like, changing the world. Like, they really thought they were doing something. And even I thought they could do something. I used to think, because I was such a two here, right? If you guys don't know, if you're new to my audience, I have a level system of obser um, observational philosophy. It's like an it's like a introspective philosophy spectrum I created. Links in the description. I was, like, such a two here. Maybe, like... Yeah, I was like like a pretty good too. And I was so, guys, I made a video. It's so cringe. I have the cringiest video, it's private now, of me basically saying like, we need to get Carl and Lacey Green and all these people together. And we need to come together to be the new generation who will like move politics in a good direction. And it's like, what a clown, bro. What a clown I was to think any of these people gave a fuck about making a better world. They just want a world they're comfortable in, which to be fair is what everyone wants. But what's comfortable comfortable for you isn't comfortable for everybody else. But Carl matured a lot over the years. He became a father. He, you know, has this wife. He did become a much more grown up, like much more of a grown up. I think he's still like, again, we do not agree on ideas. And I would never want to live in a world where like we all couldn't get along. But the truth is, is like, He's definitely not trying to get along, you know? And I think that's what's so difficult about this time on the internet is I remember because of the way they treated Anita Sarkeesian, I became a feminist. I went from being, I'm not a feminist to becoming a feminist because of the, Carl is one of the reasons I became a feminist. And also he's not the reason I didn't become a feminist, but he did make me wonder like, why don't I align with feminism? For the same reason I'm not a conservative. Y'all are short-sighted and very stubborn and none of you care about compromise. All of politics is about winning and it's gross. It's gross, okay? It's like a really disgusting part of politics and people have to remember this as much as you talk about moral outrage and you are just playing like royalty games with people and you think you're better than them. You're not. Politics is the royalty game. And everybody who's in it is much more privileged than people who literally cannot spend time paying attention to politics because they have to survive. It is a privileged position to play politics, guys. As much as you keep thinking it's not, it absolutely is. Come. I think it's, yeah, it depends on the child really, doesn't it? I suspect he started becoming a little self-aware about how this whole conversation was sounding. And by the way, I'm not saying you shouldn't stand up for yourself and do politics when you need to. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying pay attention to the like the privilege that lets you play politics because it is it isn't about compromise. It is about winning. And remember, that's why a lot of people, the majority of people don't pay attention to it because they're too busy commuting to work. Now, to be fair, if you want to change policy, you do have to pay attention enough. But that's the thing. You can do it without being in politics. You can vote without being in politics. You can change the world without being in politics. Being in politics is different than paying attention and voting, like, in trying to advocate for civil rights. It sounds the same, but it is different. Following a discussion about sexual customs in ancient Rome involving minors, Sargon cracked a joke about it. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, no, I can be quoted saying you can f young boys. Um. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the media picked it up and ran with it. In all fairness, you're kind of asking for it when you say things like, it depends on the child. Even out of context, it's very easy for the media to paint that a certain way. Especially considering the spotty track record that some other online personalities from this period oh. had with the same topic. Shout out to Milo Yiannopoulos, who recently did an interview with Peterson about his controversy and cancellation. If you remember that time.
topic. This is especially ironic considering his attempted smear of Jim with an equally dishonest approach. But regardless, it doesn't make the media coverage of Sargon putting his foot in his mouth any better. They actually went as far as to make a Frankenstein out of multiple completely unrelated quotes, including one he made in entirely other streams. It's actually not as controversial as you think. For example, I think in the Netherlands, the age of consent is something like 12 or 14. It's actually surprisingly young to Western, to sort of like, you know, English sense of, yeah. you know, speaking sensibilities. The thing is, this is actually something that's happened many, you know, many times in human history. Like the, the ancient Greeks practiced pederasty and it was considered completely normal where young yeah. boys would have relationships. Sargon defended himself pretty well, doing his best to clarify the misleading parts of the article, but he'd already cemented himself as the main vulnerability of UKIP as far as PR went. They got to the point that the party's leader at the time straight up walked out during an interview when this topic was brought up. That kind of comment, though, has prompted some concerns. How many times are you going to ask me the voters? same question? How many times are you going to ask me the same question? Thank you very much. All of this is basically because Sargon was just big enough to have some degree of mainstream relevance, but small enough that people weren't that familiar with his content. Additionally, a lot of these statements were lost in the middle of long streams, meaning an enemy of his was very unlikely to ever find out about them, since you'd have to listen to him talk for hours in order to get the juicy stuff. However, the juicy stuff was definitely seen as quite juicy to journalists. In another section of the video, Mr. Benjamin uses racial slurs. So, f off, it's okay for me to call you this, because racism is power plus prejudice. There are other sections of this video. God, that's the thing about like, this is why I don't want to discuss politics either because like people are so dumb and they don't know they're dumb. Like for him to say, I can call you a racial slur because racism is what discrimination plus prejudice. Is that what he said? Or power plus prejudice. It's like, no, that's not the point. That's not the point of the argument. It's like, I don't understand how you guys don't know. That's not the part of the, like the point of the argument. And again, you know, it's not about the slur. It's about the context in which the slur is like used. It's not about the slur existing. Slurs aren't offensive because they exist. They're offensive because of the context in which they are used. Often the context being offensive. He was being offensive when using the slur. He wasn't trying to be not offensive. That's the problem is like in all these situations where people are like, oh, it's all about the context. The context is always offensive. Not because it's always offensive no matter the context, but because every time they try to use it in context, they're offensive. Like, there's a huge difference, and he doesn't get that. He doesn't get that he's just offensive as a person. And he's trying to do it, but he does know because it's a part of the, the tongue-in-cheek. It's a part of the, <gasps> like, saying, I wouldn't even grape you. You know that's offensive. Like, you know that is offensive. It is one thing, like, you know that's offensive, bro. Come on. Which we can't show you because they are too offensive. Personally, I find racism, racist jokes funny. You have a video where you call Chinese people yes. and by all accounts, that because is racist. Because words have meaning and you don't know what the meaning of that word was. You, d you don't know what the context was, what the narrative of it is. That's the point. It's broadly accepted as a racist term. Yeah, I know. That's why I used it. As astounding as it may be to see how on a- Like, you're not explaining why- Ooh! Oh my gosh. My bad. Why in that context, it makes sense for you to use it. Like you're not explaining why you're not using it in a racist context. But a joke can be a racist joke or it can have some truth behind it. Like when I was growing up, I'd hear a lot of people tell racist jokes and my job was to figure out, is there truth behind your joke? Like, are you are you saying the joke because you just think it's funny? Are you saying, are you, do you think it's funny because you know it's like bad? Or do you, are you saying the joke because you actually believe a part of the joke? And that's what it's so, that's why it's so like weird when people are, because language is meant to convey something. So an offensive joke is like, are you saying it? And then people do try to just be edgy. And I think that's also like just a sign of immaturity. I think trying to be edgy is a sign of immaturity and all people have all moments of like immaturity, right? But I think his edginess is just immature. And I also think that ultimately given his political beliefs and given his track record he probably subconsciously believes some of it to some extent i don't know if he truly believes men and women are equal i don't know that about carl i'm not as convinced but he could because lots of people don't right the misogyny in their communities is proof of that i think lots of people especially men in these positions they don't and i think i do think their audiences are reflections of that there are obviously male audiences that obviously are more egalitarian but his audience was not and i know because as one of the few women in the sphere as a few women in the sphere that was promoted often by these communities i was always given backlash that other men didn't get or men didn't get i've i've seen it in the debate sphere too 
Like there's an expectation as being one of the only women in the space that is different. I feel the difference. I see it in the comment sections. I'm like, oh, it's different. I'm less obviously worried about it now because 70% of my audience is women. But back in the day when my audience was mostly men, it was like a battlefield every time I came to work because they were just there to basically tell me I was stupid. Even if I said the same thing, one of their favorite guys had just said 10 minutes ago, it didn't matter because it was coming from me. Apologetic he was throughout this whole ordeal. Realistically, these are the kind of comments you can defend if you're a YouTuber, just not if you're a politician. The remarks he made about Jess Phillips actually got Sargon under investigation by the police, and I'm wow. not even sure what they were investigating. His ability, or lack thereof, to go <laughs> gorilla mode? In any event, multiple members of UKIP didn't like where this was heading and left the party entirely. Eventually, they lost up to 80% of their seats, which put Sargon on DEFCON 1 as he scrambled to promote his campaign as much as possible. However, his infamy preceded him wherever he went, as he had a hard time being in any crowd of people without getting milkshaked. In one instance, someone even cartoonishly threw a fish at him. To put it bluntly, UKIP was cooked. Come election day, the party got a measly 3.3% of the vote, becoming the second least voted for party in the running. Neither Sargon nor Count Dankula managed to get a seat in parliament. Now, while Sargon wasn't helping UKIP stay afloat whatsoever, it probably would have fallen apart on its own since that kind of thing happens in politics all the time for a variety of reasons. For example, a lot of people who supported the party were simply attached to Nigel Farage, and when he left, so did they. Regardless, this spelled the end of Sargon's short-lived political career. As if he ever tried to pursue anything similar ever again, the media would have more than enough ammo to just run the exact same train on his public perception. But this wasn't the only- It's interesting that Trump can get away with a lot of the same rhetoric, but Sargon couldn't. But Trump did. Trump has almost so- Trump has almost to the T the same rhetoric as Sargon. He's made assault jokes. He's made racist jokes. He's made co uh, uh, comments about disabled people. Like Trump has made almost the same- They're like the same level of humor. So I think that's kind of interesting that in America, it worked- but also Trump is a famous businessman and Sargon's just like a fucking YouTuber. Again, he might be big in the sphere on the internet, but in the real world, like nobody knows who the fuck you are. Trump was featured on an episode of Sex in the City. Were you on an episode of Sex in the City? No, because you're not mainstream. You're YouTube stream and YouTube is different only bad thing happening to Sargon at the time. His Twitter account got banned while he was still running for office, and his main channel was demonetized due to the Gorilla Mode remarks. Consequently, the uploads to it dwindled as he started posting daily on an alternate account, Akkad Daily, though his audience was a shell of what it once was. He was still making a very decent amount of money on Subscribestar, where he had well over 2,000 subscribers by the end of 2019. But if his objective was to be a voice of reason in the sphere of culture and politics, that possibility was long gone. In remember when that, remember when that funding website showed up? People were like, Brittany, you should join this because we don't want to do Patreon. And I was like, no. Nah. 2020, he became a member of a project called Hearts of Oak, which was supposed to be- Oh, one of his perks was joining his Discord. Speaking of which, join my Discord. Support the content up-and-coming alternative news site, but like many alt social media startups, it never really went anywhere. One of the- Oh, wait, shout out to the Discord, speaking of which. Discord said philosophy is so much more fulfilling, being edgy just to be edgy is immature rather than to make a specific point, I think. I think it's, I think this time period is also when commentary had fallen off and started to fall off and drama, drama YouTube was growing. I think so too. I mean, you have to remember that commentary channels back in the day were not necessarily only about YouTube drama. If anything, they were mostly about this kind of stuff, politics, and which is actually, I guess, drama. But now it's more like relationship drama stuff. And it's funny to have him do an I Am Alex clip from way back in the day about Sargon and Anita, but now we're watching I Am Alex get, can or I Am Alex get canceled for the way he treated his girlfriend. That's what I mean. Like as much as I, and I do want to have so much faith and everybody knows how much faith I have in humanity, but ultimately like people tell you who they are and you really can't live for people's potential. And I do think a lot of these people in the space, if you defend Sargon, I think over Anita, that tells me something about you, whether you like it or not. And I'm not a big Anita fan, right? But like the way they discredited her was bullshit. The expectation Anita had on herself when talking about video games was way higher of a standard than any of the men in the space could ever live up to. And I think that's why it's bullshit. I think ultimately the way that I see it is there is a very low expectation for men to perform and get a huge reward. And women in the space have to perform at a much higher standard and never get any of the reward if your audience is primarily men especially straight men i think that's why i value my female audience so much and i don't mean this to be a slight against all straight men but for the most part there is a heavy connotation of misogyny and the straight man bubble on youtube and it shows by who you promote and how you talk about people in the sphere and also there's a lack of introspection in the debate sphere 
There's a lack of introspection, extrospection. None of these people really truly want to understand what people are going through or what the, what their life is about. They only want to like rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric. And nobody has time for that. Just nobody, you know? And so personally, that's what I've seen in this job. And I'm much happier and much more successful. I'm making more money than I've ever made, catering to an audience that's curious and open-minded and lovely and are just so interested in expanding their knowledge. Like I appreciate, like I said, every person, regardless of gender, who's in my audience. But the audience I have now is so much more curious and open-minded. They're so interesting. And when they challenge, they challenge good. You know, it's not about, you know, D- like it's not about like tearing people down you know last fruits of his all but completely gone mainstream relevance as a political commentator manifested in the form of a ruling in the Aquila obviously case which went unequivocally in Sargon's favor he wisely countersued Aquila immediately and though that did drag the case on for another half a year in August 2020 he was awarded almost $40,000 to recoup his lawyer fees given he'd paid for those lawyer fees with money donated by his fans through a GoFundMe page but regardless her lawsuit being frivolous meant she would have to cough up the 38 grand Aquila did not Ooh. embrace her loss gracefully for the past four years this person has made racist and sexist harassing content about me and other black content creators for the purpose of getting his followers to harass us he was banned that's the way it feels like that's the way it feels whether you like it or not that kind of content encourages the worst group of people on the internet to harass and bother people and whether or not you want to believe it is about you paying attention because you have to be so fucking blind not to notice it like think before you sleep he mentioned me in his last videos like even britney slyman doesn't like me and she said i shouldn't have gone to strike listen to me buddy that may be true but you have the worst fucking audience on this platform and they absolutely harassed Alyssa and it's absolutely bullshit. I kept his audience comments up on my video about him to show you what a shit audience he has. Your audience leaves horrible comments on people's videos and that is a reflection of you to some extent, to some extent at the end of the day. The majority of your audience is the rep- like is your reputation and a majority of your audience is fucking annoying and they harass people. And that's bad. Get a new audience. Delete your audience and get a new one. It's bad, but it's from you being a hater, Gator. You don't understand the people you make content about. You make the content and you have strong opinions, but you don't even think about what you're commenting on. You just think like, this is what's going to push my narrative. I don't like it. Carl, but like Carl acting like his audience didn't do that thing is, that's insane. Like that is insane to me. And that's the problem. Like, I don't know how you don't feel bad in some way. Like, again, you're not the representation of some of your audience. You're not the, like, you're not. But if the majority of your audience, if that's the vibe of your community, you are the reason that is happening. There is nuance here. Okay, there are communities on the internet. People, even if they mention the YouTuber's name, the haters come out of the woodwork. They're like, it's like Voldemort over here, right? And that's the problem is like if mentioning your name brings out the worst people in your community to harass other people, that's a reflection of you. Period. And from VidCon when they forged badges and yelled over us on panels. Then Carl Benjamin, the person I'm referring to, ran for office in England and was so repugnant, he said his female opponent was too ugly for him to rape her. The judge decided to throw out my case. Then in March, the very same white supremacist decided to counter sue for legal fees because I responded to one of those little boys harassing me by calling him a racist. He claimed my case was, therefore, never about copyright infringement. So today, I found out that because I responded to a racist on Twitter, I am expected to pay this man, who is incredibly racist and terrible, $38,000 because I responded to racism directed at me. She closed off the thread by showing the full name of the judge who threw out her case, despite the fact that she admitted her lawyer screwed up the initial filing that caused Sargon to win it so easily. She also brought up his GoFundMe. Oh, which re- interesting. Yeah. Ooh, girl. Messy, messy, messy. Is over $120,000, suggesting she'd counter sue to get it, though I very much doubt that will ever happen. While some of her own fans showed support, the rant was met with plenty of mockery as well, and the whole case was largely seen as a positive for the YouTube black... Ooh, another example of this is when the quartering made a video about a Seattle comic book store that didn't, they had a comic book in their store and apparently it was made by some sort of racist of some kind. I don't remember the details. And the content, the person at the store didn't realize they had it in stock and was like, oh my God, I don't want to sell that. The YouTuber who came to buy the comic, reviews comics, I think that's what he used to do. He was denied buying the comic book. So he made a video about it. And he said, look, honestly, like, 
I don't want to talk bad about the comic book store. I remember this is years and years ago, so I could be misremembering, but he did say, I think I remember him saying that he didn't want people to harass this comic book's owner, but he thought it was interesting that they wouldn't sell him the comic book. And then I think quartering, I remember it being Jeremy, went on a tirade against this place and they false reviewed this comic book store because they were mad about it. This is not good. Like, this is not good. A business in America should be able to decide if they're going to sell a comic book or not. And if they want to have a vibe for their shop, let them. But also, the store owner wasn't rude. It was just like, oh my God, I didn't know I had that in. Is it okay if I don't sell it to you? There, There's a lot of reasons people do these things. But it was the idea that you were willing to write a false review that was crazy to me. Now, of course, from a philosophy sense, humans are going to human and none of this matters. But I do pay attention to these things. In the same way that I wouldn't want anyone in my life who like steals specifically things from people, like taking people's wallets or doing something really like that, I'm happy to get you help. I'm happy to get you therapy, but I'm not, I'm not going to trust you around me because I'm afraid I'm going to be your next target. Hello. But also more than that, it's like, I don't want somebody in my life who's false reviewing people's businesses on the internet because they don't like them. That's crazy. Whether you're a progressive or whatever you are, I don't care. It's insane that you do that. And it's insane that it would be associated with your audience en masse. And I I do, I really do believe, in my opinion, that again, content creators are not responsible for what they, their small portions of their audience do. But if large portions of your audience are doing it, then that's an association of reputation. And at the same time, like, you have to decide how you feel about that. Because I don't know, man, I think I'd feel pretty guilty I try my hardest, again, to make sure that my audience, like, even to this day, like, don't go bother people. Who cares? You can give your own opinions. Like, you don't represent me. You're your own people. But if I noticed that I was encouraging very bad behavior out of my audience, I would try, I would really want to try to reform that, you know, to the best of my ability. I don't think these men understand, like, you are saying the jokes. Like, your jokes are encouraging bad behavior. Stop saying the jokes. Platform since it set a precedent for what was considered transformative and showed that for the first time in a long while, it wasn't blindly punishing anyone right wing. Besides Aquila, there was one other public person randomly mauling about Sargon. Author Mike Brooks, who wrote a novel taking place in the Warhammer 40k universe. In the story, there was an orcish slave master called Sarkon a God, an obvious reference to Sargon. While it was very much intended to be an own, for one, it was silly that this guy's way of calling Sargon out was to create a meanie character and name it after him. Secondly, as Sargon pointed out, this just meant he was now a part of the canon, an overall W. Around the same time, he also launched his new endeavor, The Lotus Eaters. While it was initially supposed to be a multimedia website, it eventually- It's doing pretty good, right? Isn't this his main source of income? focused its efforts on a podcast format, which became relatively successful with over 400,000 subs and over 250 million views. While the relevance he once had in the mid-2010s was long gone, Sargon was still doing well for himself, got married, and had two kids. He hasn't completely abandoned his online presence mm. and political stance and occasionally still uploads to the Sargon channel, but he struck a healthy balance between it and his personal life. I've been Turkey Tom. Thanks for watching. And until next time, leave me alone. That's pretty funny. Until next time, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious on what Benjamin's future might be, but what a blast from the past, huh? That really felt like memory lane. And my head in Miller Bond, my belly's being fed, and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool